Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm the founder and CEO of Monarchia Technologies. I'm also the uh, former co-lead of the Innovative Medical Devices Industrial Plan in France, which is now merged into the Future of Medicine Solution, um, part of this uh, steering committee of this thing. So I want to give you a bit of perspective on uh, what it takes to disrupt medicine. I want to echo a few things said this morning by JD and, and I think Alice about disrupting medicine. There's really almost nothing more important uh, than disrupting medicine. It's, it's greatly needed because we all know healthcare systems going bankrupt, et cetera, et cetera. But um, to echo, I'm sure many of you have watched these phenomenal uh, HBO host John Oliver after the attacks in Paris, uh, he gave this phenomenal video and I want to echo what he says. You want to disrupt medicine? Good fucking luck. Um, it is extremely hard. And you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. I want to encourage people to do it, but I think it's important to realize how difficult it's gonna be and maybe also to make sure we all understand each other on what it means to disrupt. There are many innovative companies doing medical devices in France, in Israel, in, in the US, everywhere. Um, most of these innovative devices are great advancement for medicine. They're not necessarily disruptive. Uh, disruption means you're not building a better mousetrap, you're rethinking completely the way to get rid of the mice. And so when you disrupt, things happen that usually don't happen when you just innovate. So um, you had a mathematician this morning, I'm an astrophysicist by training, uh, so which shows again that uh, uh, it's important to have people I think from different perspectives uh, joining the quest for, for disrupting medicine. Uh, so, just a few words about what we do. Um, okay. So, um, we have basically had this crazy idea 15 years ago that uh, there was uh, an area uh, of, uh, of uh, the medicine today that was really suboptimal, um, which is that uh, when you want to either diagnose or treat a cancer at some point, either very early cancer or, or a bit later, you need microscopy. You need to be able to look at cells simply that because cancer is a, it's a disease of cells. So uh, you take a piece of the patient at some point and you send it to a lab and it's been examined under a microscope. If you're a surgeon, at some point during surgery, you're gonna take a piece of the patient and you're gonna uh, send it to someone right next to the operating room who's gonna try to give you an assessment of uh, the microscopic uh, nature of the tissue. So what we thought, it, it was suboptimal, we thought we can bring the microscope inside the patient, and then in the second stage, bring an entire lab inside the patient and stop having this completely separated events which lead to uh, many problems that I will, I'll show you in a second. So our mission is really to eliminate those diagnostic and treatment uncertainties by enabling this cellular health assessment, if you will, which is basically live microscopic imaging. Why is this disruptive? Because today, as I said, you have a category of doctors called pathologists who are trained to look at microscopic images. They are certified. They give the final signature saying, this is cancer, this is not cancer. Um, so they look, at, uh, uh, microscopy, they, they look at dead tissue under a microscope and they make images like that. So what we're proposing is a completely game-changing approach, which is we do all this in vivo, uh, almost anywhere in the body, and, and we make images, we make videos of live tissue at the microscopic level. So we see things as they move, as they function, so it's a completely different type of information, which has, of course, similarities to ex vivo pathology, but is bringing a lot more information. And you can see here, um, this is on the top, this is uh, in the colon, during colonoscopy, someone who has uh, something called uh, ulcerative colitis, and you see those inflamed microvessels and red blood cells flowing by. This is all done live during, during colonoscopy. Uh, at the bottom, you see uh, pulmonary alveoli in a breathing patient. And those, those things you see in the middle of the alveolus are macrophages because of cigarette smoke. Uh, if it wasn't a smoker, you wouldn't see anything in these alveoli. And then in the middle, you see um, what is going to be um, the next uh, big thing in, in medicine, personalized medicine, molecular imaging, which means we will have new molecular markers 
which will mark specific areas of the body, specific areas of an organ, because it's um, in, inflamed or it's early cancer, and we'll be able to observe that at the microscopic level and characterize it in, in, in real time. This is done on animals today, but will be done uh, later. So uh, really, uh, to do this, you need to bring all this to, to the operating room, to the endoscopy room, to the radiology room, and then you need to have, of course, uh, a certain type of doctors uh, who start reading images which they're not used to. And then what about the other ones? Uh, are they still part of this, uh, this diagnostic system or not? So there's a lot of questions around this, which makes this whole endeavor pretty difficult. Um, so just an example, um, and which show you why it's so difficult to, uh, uh, to disrupt. This is in the field of pancreatic lesions. There's a situation today where uh, characterizing pancreatic lesions is very difficult, and 61% of patients with a benign pancreatic lesion go to surgery, go to pancreatic surgery. A major surgery costs between 50 and 100 thousand dollars in France, 50 thousand euros. Um, major complications, mortality is pretty high, ranges from three to 14 percent, depending on where you get operated. Uh, can become diabetic and many other complications. 61%. Uh, of benign patients go to surgery. They could live with the lesion their entire life without any problem. So we brought the microscope inside the lesion, and there was no other way to see the microscopic nature of a lesion before, because biopsies are not taken on a pancreatic lesion. And we made these images, which are now being, have now been uh, shown to be very specific of the nature of the lesion. In particular, benign lesions can be characterized with 100% specificity. Why this, is this not approved, why is this not adopted uh, you know, widely around the world yet? Well, because there are people which are pretty, who are pretty unhappy about this. Uh, surgeons, for instance. Surgeons losing the capacity to do pancreatic surgeries. But also hospital administrators, obviously, who don't see losing surgeries, which are uh, a, a major source of income, as a good thing. So we're going to get back to this. So um, just to give you a perspective on, on you know, what we did for the past 15 years, uh, created the company in 2000. And by the way, interestingly, um, what we had then was not something you could probably raise money uh, on today. Uh, we practically had nothing. We had a patent. We had a, a proof of concept, which was really not a proof. Uh, but for some reason, it worked then. Maybe it was the heart of the bubble, and people were looking for something else than, than uh, uh, internet companies. Um, so then, you know, years of R&D, pure R&D, or hopefully, as Nicholas says, it innovation, not R&D, um, came up with uh, a number of different devices. This is supposed to show you something. We did things, actually, in 15 years. It's not just an empty line. Um, here it comes. So years of R&D, um, launching a first product, uh, big mistake, uh, too soon, uh, not in our core focus, then launch new products, launch clinical trials, uh, which seem to never end, uh, also because our device is really a platform that can be applied to so many things that it's always difficult to find what to do next. Um, but you know, along the line, um, a lot of world's first and, and really interesting things. All this being funded first by private investors, um, and I'm going to come back to this and I think echo uh, what was just said before. And then we went public. And as was said in the previous talk, went public way too soon, of course, because uh, if you go public too soon, you're facing the short-term expectations, as, uh, as Nicolas was saying. Um, but in France, the problem is, where do you find 50, 60 million euros uh, to go to the next phase? You don't, and I'm going to get back to this. So today we have uh, a platform which can serve a lot of different needs, and, and the company is currently really changing its commercialization strategy to go from basically a direct proof of concept, commercial proof of concept, to, um, uh, to really finding a new way to address the markets with commercial partners, large-scale commercial partners, who can leverage on, on what we have and, uh, and introduce the technology in many different ways, fully integrated into existing platforms, such as robotics platforms, uh, interventional radiology platforms, uh, industry platforms, etc. OK, so switching gears. Um, this obviously has been no walk in the park, as I, as I said, and because I don't like walks in parks, I'm showing you something I like to do, uh, which is much more fun than walk in the parks, but basically doing this is not 
as smooth and well orchestrated as this. This is the message of the, of the slide. Um, so, oddly for me to say this, but I think it's important so that we can reinvent the way to do this. You start a medtech company today, it's clearly difficult and the odds are probably against you. Um, you, you there are so many hurdles along the way that uh, it takes passion and I would even say love. Um, you need to be really committed to, uh, uh, to this and you need to love what you do and I think uh, uh, you, know, you, you find people who want to do this, which is great. You need resilience. Um, the, the time to exit today has greatly stretched. I think we all know that. So it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of money. And so, uh, you know, I said need capital in excess of 50 million, but well in excess of 50 million. And I think one important thing about the highly regulated system we, we evolve in is that it's taking more and more time, more and more money. It's almost getting to what a drug takes. And this is a problem because devices usually were faster to get to market and to be adopted, and it's possibly not the case anymore. Um, and you know, rounds are significant. Recently, there's a very stealth company which uh, just appeared under the radars, uh, Oris Robotics. In six months, they raised two rounds, 31 million, 150 million in the second round. This company doesn't have a product on the market, doesn't have FDA clearance. It's very early stage robotics. Now, granted, the CEO and founder is one of the most important person in robotics today, founder of almost all robotics company worldwide, including Intuitive Surgical. So, of course, great track record, but still, can you raise 150 million in one round in France? Well, occasionally, uh, there's maybe has been one or two such rounds, and this is, this is one of our key problems. But, you know, there's hope. There's a lot of hope. Uh, again, there's, there's phenomenal rewards. Um, and there's been dozens of big winners, both on the venture capital side and on the entrepreneur side, of course, and most importantly, on the patient side. And, you know, we, we all know disruptive innovations that have made it really big. Um, you know, we don't get our chest open anymore for coronary bypass. We get stents, we get angioplasty, we get all these kind of things. We would never want to go back to what we had before. Now, a slight digression, and, and which is what was said before, um, first of all, yeah, best companies are often founded in the toughest times. But interestingly, if you look at venture capital in healthcare, especially in medical devices today, it has basically failed. So uh, there needs to be also reinvention of how, uh, how companies are funded. Uh, and hopefully, we'll, we'll find this soon. Um, another digression is uh, something that's been very important for me. This book. Uh, by Ben Horowitz, a uh, famous entrepreneur turned uh, famous VC, uh, founded, of course, Andreessen Horowitz uh, Healthcare, um, not healthcare, but venture fund. Um, this is a book that I think that every CEO, every entrepreneur should read. It's, it's a great help. Um, there's a whole, parag a whole chapter on the struggle, and uh, you know, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically, yes, there are moments of struggle. Uh, they can be pretty, pretty tough. But, uh, you know, as he says, that's where greatness comes from. So hopefully uh, many of us will, will find this. Um, and another line that I think uh, great, which I think applies more and more to healthcare entrepreneurs, uh, is that, okay, if you quit, you don't win. Um, and if you uh, win, you never quit. Anyway, so um, uh, there was mentioned in the previous talk about the ecosystem. And the ecosystem in medtech is incredibly complex. And, and, you know, there are tons of things that are happening which are not happening for digital entrepreneurs not interested in healthcare. Uh, I'll give you an example. On Monday morning, um, auditors from a notified body knocked on our door unexpectedly and came for a whole day inspection to see if we were doing our job properly of uh, managing our quality system. That's not something that a, uh, a digital entrepreneur trying to come up with a new app doing something is used to. You get, you get used to these kind of things when you're, when you're an entrepreneur in healthcare. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but basically um, those things on the right, uh, the regulators are obviously uh, the, the, tough, uh, the tough part of this slide. And there's something here that I think hasn't been mentioned yet, um, professional societies. And behind this, obviously, <coughs> doctors. And this morning, I think, JD, you said there's conservatism but you didn't really point out specifically conservatism from doctors. 
Okay, there's clearly conservatism from the healthcare system, from maybe, you know, you can blame the Ministry of Health for everything, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a joint effort that has to be done, and most of the time, I feel that most doctors are on the sidelines. They're waiting for things to happen, and they're waiting for things to be fully baked. Here you go, you have this new device, it's reimbursed, you're gonna make 200 bucks every time you use it, uh, it's easy to, uh, to use, you got uh, all the service, etc. We all know this is the bulk of the market, and this is 95% of physicians. I would add cynically that most of these people care about only one thing, the $200 they're going to make with the device. And, you know, it's, it's tough to realize, but it's often the case. And so I think there's been a paradigm where previously, because it was so easy, maybe in the years in the 80s and 90s, to sell innovation to hospitals, you had something new, great, let's, let's get it, and you know, doctors will play with it, will attract patients, it's going to be wonderful. Post-2008, no, this is completely gone. Every piece of equipment you have to sell goes through a level of scrutiny that's absolutely un unimaginable. And, and, and so it's extremely hard to, to do this. And so doctors have to realize that if they don't move, they will not get the innovations anymore. And there are actually certain categories of doctors, possibly gastroenterologists, who have left so many innovations go dead in their hands because they're not really helping them to become widely adopted that venture capitalists, and you know, I know a lot of these guys in the US say, will never reinvest in GI ever again. They don't want to invest in this field. And so professional societies have a responsibility to realize that and say, whoa, okay, so gastroenterology is not going to innovate, not gonna have new things in the next 20 years, whereas you know, cardiology or many others are going to. So there's a real role to play um, uh, with, with physicians and professional societies. So, you know, those interactions between all those people on, on those slides, the iterations and the major interrogations are um, very painful, very difficult to understand. And there's like tons of, of slides like this I could show you. This is from Josh Macca, a phenomenal healthcare entrepreneur. Um, it's becoming extremely difficult to go around these things and it's taking more and more time and there's uh, regulators asking you for a certain type of data, but when you show up with this type of data, they say, well, sorry, tough luck. Now we want to see a new type of data. We want to see health economics data and, and more and more things. And it's now five-year outcome study. Now we want 10-year outcome study, et cetera, et cetera. And so, again, I think there's a global effort to be made so that people are more and more aware of that, um, so that we actually get to uh, an innovation pipeline that is maybe healthier and faster to, to get to, uh, to the patients in the end. I'm going to skip talking about this, but I want to point you out to something here, which also was mentioned in, in, the, in the previous talk, which is reimbursement. So medicine has this very peculiar thing that it's a, it's a ternary system. Okay, you have the patient, you have the, the, the hospital, but then you have the payer. And no payer, no innovation. But getting a payer to pay for innovation has become increasingly difficult. I mean, very, very difficult. So um, that poses major challenges for young companies who need to find the right market to access at first. Where, where to go? So um, in France, uh, I've been advocating for many years that we needed to be successful in France before exporting our innovation. Because, okay, we can take a train, metro, and go to phenomenal hospitals, great physicians, great surgeons. So, you know, why go to Germany? Why go to the US? Why go to Japan if you can do it in France? Um, I'm afraid to say I've changed my mind and I'm gonna get to this, but I'm not sure we should, as medtech entrepreneurs, really bother with the French market because it is so difficult. There's no visibility on actually getting an innovation through the French pipeline that it's probably a waste of time and money. So there's a whole slew of very <laughs> complex concepts um, with payers. There's national payers, socialized medicine, there's private payers. But you know, payers, in, uh, reimbursement in the US is actually three things which are completely independent. Coding, coverage, and payment. You can get a code for reimbursement and you get a payment, but you don't get covered by the private payer. So it's not paid, it's crazy. Um, so 
This takes a lot of time, a lot of resources, um, a lot of expertise, which really is, is absolutely key for an entrepreneur to know about. And choosing your, your first country, are you going to choose by population? Just say, okay, well, I'm going to go to the largest population uh, country. Uh, not necessarily, because obviously going to India and China is extremely difficult. Um, so you could choose by hospital beds, um, not sure it's relevant metric uh, either, or by healthcare spending. Then, of course, you want to go to the US. Um, and, and I think that probably we should embrace in France the Israeli model, which is do your R&D in France. It's phenomenal. The best engineers on the planet, great physicians to interact with possibly, get a lot of tax credit, get subsidies from everything we get, which is really great. And when you think you're getting to something that's looking like a product, then just you know, keep your R&D where it is, don't move it, move to Boston or somewhere else if you like it better, um, and start doing marketing, clinical trials possibly, uh, and sales in the US. And just consider you're a US company with a great R&D in France. And I'm saying this to be a bit, uh, of course, on, on the provocation side, but I think that in France, things haven't moved. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this, because of course I was, I'm, I'm part of this, uh, uh, these, um, these initiatives. And, and um, you know, here, Israeli uh, fact sheets, you can see uh, it's very small, but you, you see that this is the, uh, uh, the export towards the US. Most companies in Israel, phenomenal companies in medtech, will basically sell in the US and for a number of years, then possibly start exporting in other, company, in other countries. So um, again, we, we don't need to raise a lot of money to do R&D in France, which is great. But at some point, you need to raise a lot of money. And, and, and that's probably not going to happen in France. Um, and you know, again, we have, uh, we have La French Tech. It's great. But French Tech today is really the early, it's, it's the top of this, this pipeline. And, even though we have Emmanuel Macron, as was said this morning, and you know, I love Emmanuel Macron and I work with him, he's phenomenal. Unfortunately, he can't change everything because there are other people who resist the change. And in France, we have the High Authority for Health, HIS, which is basically people evaluating medical devices the way they were evaluated 20 years ago. Um, they have no idea what's happening in the world. They haven't seen a patient in so many years. They, they, they don't know how it works. And so it's almost impossible to get through this. And then when you go through HAS by miracle, you need to get a, a code. You need to get in the, in the system, which again, is gonna take possibly years and you don't even know where it's gonna lead to. So better go to a place where there's some visibility, uh, unfortunately, unless this changes. Um, I wanna mention two, uh, a couple of more things. Um, but this I mentioned, you know, obviously the fact the whole healthcare system, as, as Nicola was saying about Obamacare, has moved to a value-based healthcare immensely complex topic because even though um, there are now accountable care organizations in the US, well, there are tons of misaligned incentives because most of, um, most of healthcare systems are still fee-for-service systems. So when you go to a hospital in the US to sell something, it's weird, you have, it's, a, it's, it's a, in transition towards an accountable care organization. So what are you pitching? Are you pitching that you're detecting more cancers, so there's gonna be more surgeries? Okay, good. Or that you're actually characterizing benign lesions and avoiding unnecessary surgeries. So it's completely schizophrenic, and sometimes you talk to people who don't even know which model they're in anymore. So it is, it is tough, and um, you know, I, I'm not sure I have a solution to that yet. Um, again, just going back, uh, but I'm not going to dwell on this, um, with working with key opinion leaders and professional societies. Probably one of the most frustrating things for me have been to work with key opinion leaders in academic medical centers, do phenomenal clinical trials, obtain excellent clinical results, and then see the same people not use your technology. And so you're coming back to see this guy at Mayo Clinic, at Cleveland, wherever, you say, so Dr. So and so, I don't understand. I, I see you're not using our technology on those pancreatic cysts uh, in, in, in your patients. Why? Well, because I'm enrolling them in another clinical trial. Y yeah, I understand, but you've proven that it's better for your patients to use our technology. Yeah, but I'm enrolling them in another clinical trial. So, of course, 
you know, what basically an academic key opinion leader wants is to publish papers which are going to bring him to the forefront of research. Uh, that's, that's their lives. So it's something to be prepared with because it's brutal when you think you have an ambassador for life and actually this ambassador, as soon as it's proven, is going to turn away to something else, which is the newest toy, if you want, hopefully becoming a newest tool. Uh, and then you're left with, okay, well, I don't really have an ambassador anymore. So that's a really tough one. And again, as I was saying, um, I think the work with professional societies is, uh, is very tough because they have a, also a short-term view, basically how much money you're going to give them, um, and that's, that's not great. So maybe there's really ways to rethink this. Um, should we talk to physicians to convince them, or should we go directly to payers to convince them they have to convince their physicians to use the technology because simply it's not only better for their patients, but it's also better for their own uh, business. And that might be uh, something to do in, in the future. So, um, you know, I would just add that uh, for an entrepreneur, having a good board is very important, but I think I'm out of time, so I'm not going to uh, talk about this. So, you know, in, in, uh, in the end, as a conclusion, again, I want to continue to encourage people to do this, but I want to tell you that uh, it's, it's not a smooth ride. I think it, it resembles roughly this. Um, so it's not for the faint of heart, but uh, it's very exciting. Um, and you know, it's always uh, things on the right and on the left where you, you can fall into, but it's exciting. Yeah, so again, uh, thank you very much. And uh, if there's any questions, you know. there's, there's a good one coming. Okay, thank you very much, Sasha. Thank you, thank you again.